Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 75 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. John B. And I'm joined <laughs> here by my exquisite co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, a man who used to always wear a track suit, but the only thing he ran was OTC deals for his nefarious clients. I am talking about the Sri Lankan Rick Ross. JJ, how's it going, hey, man? Good, brother. Good. Sorry, sorry, I kept you waiting. My co- computer spontaneously rebooted. Oh, no worries. You made it. You made it just on time. Just on time. And our <laughs> guest today made history as the youngest female trader on the New York Stock Exchange and only the second Black woman to ever trade on the floor. She's the host of the Mind, Body, and Wealth podcast, a keynote speaker, author, film and TV producer, and the host of Going Public, which is airing October 19th. Of course, I'm talking about the lovely Lauren Simmons. Lauren, how's it going? Hi, hello. I'm so excited to join you. And oh my goodness, my computer started the other day right before a scheduled Zoom as well. And I was like, what is going on? Why? I don't even remember pressing any buttons. So I'm right there with you, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's JJ. Yeah, no, it just. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it just had a mind of its own. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Lauren, you don't have an excuse. He's a little bit older. Uh, you're of the younger oh. generation. So, uh, you know, it's all good. Lauren. Congrats on your uh, your podcast. Uh, you landed a deal with Spotify, uh, Spotify original. That's really cool. Uh, could you put in a good word for us? Like, how, how do we get our own original uh, Spotify podcast? <laughs> pitch a whole lot of producers and pitch a whole lot of streaming platforms and you can go from there. But yeah, so grateful for my podcast. So grateful for the team. Uh, so grateful for the best case uh, team, which are the producing partners on that. And we are ranked number two in overall top business mm-hmm. podcast here in America. So I'm, I'm so grateful. That has been a journey that I've been working on for two years. And it's so excited to see uh, that vision come to light. So I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Absolutely. Shout, shout out to you and your podcast. I really uh, appreciate your hustle. I know you've been real busy. What's uh, so what, what's the theme of the podcast? What are some of like the topics? I know you uh, it's relatively new. Yeah. Yeah, it's relatively new. We are episode three is dropping Wednesday. Oh my goodness. What are dates? The 13th. So tomorrow, but I don't know when this comes out. Um, but yeah, mind, body, wealth is all about the interconnectedness of the mind, the body, and this wealth mindset. So we have incredible thought leaders that come on and they talk about their personal journey with money and it's just fun. It's relatable, digestible, um, for that younger demographic, 18 to 30. Uh, and so we talk all things finance, all things holistic, um, and we have incredible, incredible people on this season. I mean, episode one was with Jordan and Dino, who is my dear friend, but he is quoted as a celebrity chef. You would have seen him on uh, Selena, um, her TV chef show. And yeah, they hit it off. They were great. And it was so exciting to hear his personal relationship with money and how he spends his money today and uh, and what that journey is like. And I think the more that we can have these open, fluid conversation when it comes to money and finance, I think the better off we are when it comes to obtaining generational wealth and creating money from a holistic way. I have high income earners who are my clients and they still live paycheck to paycheck. So every project that I'm attached to is an extension of making sure that all of the mind body wealth is connected, but making sure that I create access to give people a seat at the table, uh, but to also feel empowered once they get the seat at the table, which leads us to go in public, which is why I'm here today. And, and I'm so excited to, to dive deep into that subject. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I love what you're doing. Because I uh, yeah, like the, the talk of money can be very like taboo or like, you know, weird to bring up in conversation. So I, I love they just going at it full force. And uh, just a reminder to the listeners, if you'd like to join JJ, myself, and a supportive community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Lauren, I know you've touched on it many times in different interviews, but for the listeners who aren't familiar with you, could you tell them uh, how you became a floor trader? Because I don't think finance was something you uh, originally went for. No, but I will say that life prepares everyone, not just me, 
uh, for moments before we're even realizing what we're preparing for. And so I've always been in male dominated spaces. When I was in college, I studied genetics at Kennesaw State in Georgia, where I'm from. And prior to genetics, when I was in high school, we had to go on a four year curriculum path that we wanted to do. I got into architectural engineering, which is something that I initially picked, but it was something that I stuck with. And in both of those scenarios, I was always pretty much the only in the room. And if I wasn't the only, it was very few of me that was in the room and whether that was being an African-American or whether that was being a woman. And so coming to the New York Stock Exchange, I graduated college December 13, 2016. And the day that I graduated, I hopped on a plane to New York City with no connections and uh, reached out, did a lot of cold reaching out to people on LinkedIn. And very long story short, I met a man who works at one of the big financial firms. You could probably name the top four. He worked at it. And he said to me that his company wouldn't hire me, but would I be open to an equity trading position at the New York Stock Exchange? Of course, I said yes. Um, For me, I thought minimally I'll get this on my resume. I'll work this job for four years. Came to the trading floor the next day and was offered a job within the first five minutes of meeting the CEO of Rosenblatt Securities. Nice. Nice. See, so we, we've, uh, Lauren, we, we've had on uh, floor traders, uh, numerous floor traders uh, on this podcast, but, but always like guys from what, JJ, the 80s, uh, the 90s. Um, yeah. what, JJ, maybe just, uh, maybe just touch on like, uh, you know, maybe like what the floor used to be like or some of the people we talked to. Uh, Cause I, I'm interested, Lauren, to how maybe it's like changed. Cause like you're pre- the most recent person we've talked to that's like right off the floor, like a few years. So what do you think, Jay? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, I guess the, the NICE was a bit different. I was an institutional trader in Vancouver on and ran a U.S. desk. So um, Vancouver had a lot of female traders, um, you know, for it was not a surprising thing. My boss, when I started as a trader, was female. And um, so I, you know, it wasn't like a, a rare occurrence. We had a lot. Uh, I mean, it was male dominated, but there were a lot of women in the Vancouver community. And uh, yeah. Especially, and then when I worked with, I mean, I worked with market makers out of Jersey my whole life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember the lady who ran the floor at Spear Leeds and Kellogg, that was a 400 trader floor. Um, you know, and it was, it was a woman who ran it. And uh, so I never really, I never really, you know, uh, took any notice of that. I mean, there weren't as many women as men naturally. And back then we were good God, we were like animals. Like, I mean, human, we'd be living in human resources. Now, if you spoke the way you used to speak, you know, it was really rough. And I mean, it was, but you know, the, the women that I worked with, they were, you know, they, they gave as good as they got. They didn't take any crap from anybody. And most of the women that I worked with were actually, uh, you know, better traders like Danny from Meyerson. Uh, yeah, Danny, shout out to Danny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she was a, she was a fantastic market maker. So, but yeah, the, the, the industry has really, really changed quite a bit. It must've been, uh, it must've been quite something for you to be on a floor. I'm, I'm really happy that you had that experience and, and, uh, and broke through, especially at a young age. I love seeing people, um, you know, come into an industry and shake it up a bit. Um, and I think the brokerage industry, uh, you know, we're all just, you know, a bunch of savage old rickety guys and it's good when some youth comes in and, and, you know, disrupts. Um, I think we should have more of that. Um, I think it's healthy for the industry and it's, it's good for us. You know, yeah. Just, just on I, our toes. I will say JJ. Yeah. I, I think people get fixated that I was the only woman on the floor and, and I was at the time in a room with 250 men, but to your point, there was a time when the New York stock exchange currently where it stands today, the New York stock exchange is the only place that has human traders. Yeah. With that being said, the New York Stock Exchange in its prime had thousands of thousands of traders. Exactly. Um, And from what I'm told, for every 200 men, there was at least one woman about. I don't know if that was if that ran true for you. I I mean, I still remember meeting Muriel Siebert at a uh, Yeah. she was a force to be reckoned with. She was really yeah, cool. I've, I've yeah. heard. Yeah, Mariel Siebert, for people that don't know, she was the first uh, female trader at the New York Stock Exchange and has, you know, just an icon and a legend and obviously paved the way and opened doors for people like me, of course, but, you know, for all women. So, it, you know, 
But yeah, the, the New York Stock Exchange has obviously changed and mm-hmm. we are talking about an institutional floor that came from thousands of traders to yeah. now one room exactly. where, yeah. where yeah. there's probably even now in 2021, less than 250 men, <clears throat> excuse yeah, me. Sure. Wow. So, but for from what I'm told for every 200-ish men, there was about one woman. So yeah. if there were multiple 200s, there were multiple yeah. women. Yeah. Um, and you know t- things change, and and that's that's just the nature of the business and where we're at. <clears throat> Lauren, um, you know, I uh, I'm a retail trader. I never traded institutionally or anything like that. And so, like my reference for the floor floor traders is like what you see I see in the movies, right? The the chaos, the people yeah. yelling, et cetera, et cetera. How much <laughs> is that true? Or just just maybe give us a glimpse into what the environment was like on the floor. Um, yeah, I mean, there was chaos for the open and the close and definitely for um, IPOs and, and big, bigger IPOs. Or I think Spotify was a bigger IPO, uh, what not think it was while I was down there. And Snap was a bigger IPO when I was down there. Um, but I think, you know, we, we can say that technology has definitely lent a hand and one, the progression of why there are less men on the floor, but to the, the the chaos, the noise that we see. I mean, during the day, it's more passive trading. Um, and so those those moves that you would probably see in like the Wolf of Wall Street and like what's so iconic and in, in like a lot of these trading movies, it's just not the same. Um, but, you know, the New York Stock Exchange does have a purpose. And, um, and I even think, you know, throughout this pandemic, we also saw that was the first time that the New York Stock Exchange had closed their doors for a continuous uh, period of time. And so a lot of people were trading from home. So it, it you know, it we're moving with technology. It's a different place. I think I, the New York Stock Exchange will always be an iconic place. Um, but I think not just even with the New York Stock Exchange, I just think globally people realize that you can essentially do your job from home and, mm-hmm. uh, don't have to physically, you know, be somewhere. I mean, you and I are on a Zoom call right now doing this podcast. So, I mean, really, you can you can be anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm curious, Lauren, to uh, your learning curve um, for you becoming a floor trader. Was, was there any part of the job that was like something you really? Uh, it was hard work. It was something you really had to work at. I think it was more imposter syndrome. I mean, I was trading a notational value of $150 million a day and just thinking of how much money that was. And if I was to bail and being so young and, and in my case, I was the only female African-American trader and, you know, the second African-American woman to work down there. That that just comes with a lot of noise in your head on an, on an already stressful job. No um, but I, I do remember, you know, my boss encouraging me to make mistakes in the sense of make mistakes so you can learn from these mistakes, because I think um JJ, you would probably say the same thing. Like when it comes to trading, accountability is is the, one of the first things that I, I learned. If you oh, make a mistake, yeah. you do not get to blame it on your partner. You don't get to blame it on your boss. You don't get to hide behind anybody. You oh, have yeah. to make that mistake head on and and kind of go from that. What were you Definitely. gonna say? No, I, I know I know exactly what you're saying because uh, back in my day, we used paper tickets. Yeah. And, and you know, I, and my boss was famous for. You know, if he he pulled a bad trade, he would hide his ticket under his in, under his desk blotter, and the trade wreck lady would always be wonder, wandering around, going, "I can You know, we're we're not matching up with Knight. We're not matching up with UBS. What's going on here? You know, yeah. two days later, if the trade was profitable, the ticket would come out. So I know exactly. That's it. It's it just makes it brings back a funny funny memory. But now you know, there's no hiding from that stuff, right? No, it's and, like electronics. So. Yeah, exactly. You can't you can't hide stuff, right? You would just yeah. yeah but that's uh, yeah, no, definitely. And you know, if you screw up, uh, I think I think the best way to preserve capital is to have humility and, and admit you made a mistake quick, you yeah. know, and fix it or get and, out of it. Try to fix it, right? So yeah. that was one of the things that I learned early on, and it was a great lesson. Um, but yeah, I. I at some point got out of my head and embraced making a mistake. And I think at one point yeah. I made like a $3 million error and I was like, okay, how do we fix it? <laughs> and I can probably speak about it calmly now, but I just remember like, Oh, at the time. 
Yeah, at my boss and like, holy fuck. Like, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but it's, life. It, it's literally life and it happens and it how does. to move forward yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think especially as a trader, you can't be uh, scared to make mistakes. Um, it's just it's just part of you know no one's gonna win ninety percent of the time. It just doesn't yeah. just doesn't work that way. Your um, risk tolerance yeah. is definitely significantly higher as a trader to work in finance to be in that line of business. Like if you want to be conservative and safe, and it, it's just it, it just doesn't align, especially with the type of high risk job that we're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so Lauren, so um, maybe speaking to like your investing or trading that you do now, I know you're a busy woman. Um, do you have much time to put into, uh, you know, your, you know, stock portfolio or, you know, whatever you trade? Yeah, um, I, you know, obviously still trade personally. Um, I, yeah, I put money into my portfolio. I think the crash of last year, I definitely bought in a lot because um, that's when a lot of the, the stock uh, prices were low. And yeah, I haven't really touched it since because we are still on this pandemic journey. And I think we kind of, we'll see what 2020 looks like, 2022 looks like. I don't know about the rest of this year, but I'm, I'm definitely not making any, me personally making any moves for the remainder of the year. Okay. All right. So it was, um, you know, on top of like learning a new job, you know, moving to New York, what was there like a culture shock for you? Cause you are from in G- Georgia maybe a bit different pace than New York. Very. I mean, and that's what I love so much about the city. I mean, I now live in California, but New York is just so electric. It's so fast. It's so moving. And I think this is a place where you will see firsthand if you want to create something, it's either sink or swim. I don't think, I mean, and there are obviously so many cities, so many different towns here in America, but here in New York is one of those places where if you really don't push yourself, you will see yourself like in real time sinking and and it hurts. And New York City is not a forgiving city. You will keep trying at something and then somebody will continuously knock you down. And um, I, I, I love New York City for it's good, it's bad for all of it. And um, and obviously coming into the New York Stock Exchange was also a culture shock. I mean, I come from a family that does curse, but the amount of curse, <laughs> the amount of how gross, I love the guys on the floor, but how gross the men were with their eatiness <laughs> and their eating habits. I was like, what kind of world am I coming to? Um, so that, that was, that was different, but New York, you know, obviously always holds a place in my heart. I lived here for five years and it's so beautiful in so many different ways and so different from Georgia in so many different ways. Yeah. I, I can only imagine probably the conversations you've overheard on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just say my boss was old school. So like he believed in like opening doors for women mm-hmm. buying, like he, they bought me lunch every single day while I was on the trading floor. He didn't believe in like the men, like cursing, using derogatory terms around me. And so when he was around the men, they were polished, they were ties tied up, <laughs> suits, clothes, uh, but when he was not around, they they acted like themselves. And I set those boundaries. I set those rules as far as like certain things that I was absolutely not OK with. Ninety percent of the things I was OK with. But like some things I just was like, yeah, no, we're not going to we're not going to be saying that. But I do remember one time uh, that it slipped while my the head boss was on the floor and someone had used some kind of word. And I've never seen my boss get angry because he's he's um was is an older gentleman like 80 like 80 like yeah he's older and so he went off but like he went off in a non-cursing way which was also painful to see and he's like we have women around like you will not use these derogatory terms like go wash your mouth out with soap like I've never even like had heard people say that and so (laughs) He, yeah, he just was very old school in such a cute, charming, like respectable way. But no, I, you know, at the end of the day, like we're coming into each other's environments, you know, I'm coming into theirs and vice versa. So like, I want you to be as comfortable as being yourself as possible with thin limits. Uh, because yeah, there were definitely certain things where I'm just like, yeah, no, that's, that's too much. Yeah. Too- 
<laughs> well, shout out to to your old boss. Uh, you know, sounds sounds like a good guy. That, that's that's what's up. Um, so, Lauren, I, I I read an interview that you did, and you mentioned, um, and we, we've talked to like other guests about this as well, like how Wall Street makes it seem that like trading is this big complicated thing, which which it is in some respects, right? But that like you need them, like they only know how to trade. Um, but that's that's far from the truth, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's not complicated. I say do your due diligence, educate yourself, learn the stock market. It's not something that, you know, happens overnight. But I do think if you sat for three months, literally at CNBC, Bloomberg, financial podcasts on in the background, wrote down all the words that like you didn't hear. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Like I religiously played CNBC, Bloomberg, on my TV or at my work desk and was recording it on my phone. I would go home at night, anywhere that I didn't understand or a sector that I was like, what the heck are they talking about? I would go home, um, Google, ask the traders all the dumb questions that I wanted to ask. And that is how I learned, uh, one, to, to, to have better financial literacy when it came to trading, but just to get a grasp on like how the market moves, how stocks perform the way they do an earnings report like it i i do think that all the information is out there for people to understand how to trade and it's not as intimidating as the old uh boys club makes it seem yeah absolutely and i and i think you would agree with that right jay definitely yeah definitely uh yeah definitely i mean yeah we just uh yeah, it's, it's, it's a market, you know. People want yeah. to protect their pockets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people want to protect their pockets, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But it's a market. So at the basic level, you're like, you're buying and selling. And I think people yeah. complicate that more. Oh than my God, yeah, totally. And yeah. it's just like, and yeah. And I think the first day when my boss told me that, I was like, okay, and like, what else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what else? Oh, um, but yeah. I think, JJ, I, JJ, to your yeah. point, you were you were a market maker. So his job was a little bit more complicated than an equity trader. So what I know. what I did was I, um, you know, in in all these deals, now you guys were like a, I guess Rosenblatt was like a two dollar broker when it started in the old days, right? Yeah. What I did was I I worked with all the market makers out of Jersey and. Uh, Canada was offshore at the time. So there was something called a reg S financing back in the day where you could do a financing. And then uh, if you were an offshore entity, you could sell the stock back into the U S in 45 days and rule 144 never applied to you. So what we would do, uh, the thing you could do in Canada is we could direct trades. So I could line up the market makers all over the level two, like a chessboard, and then grab all the retail when the retail came in. Right. So basically I was just working markets, backfilling orders and creating charts for people, you know, early stage investors to get out. Um, you know, the, the colloquial term is a stock promoter. So like all the guys from Wolf and Wall Street, when that place closed down, they became stock promoters and they were my clients. Well, those, those you know, you know, from really sophisticated Swiss bankers to the, you know, the degenerates from Long Island. Um, you know, <laughs> I had, I had the whole thing. So yeah, basically I was like, just, I was kind of like a, uh, a conductor and I would move market wakers around, fill things, you know, and then cut supply when we needed to take stocks up and things like that. So yeah, that was a, it was a little bit different than, you know, being a specialist or, um, oh, okay. yeah. So I, I'd have like 30 level twos up okay. and just moving stuff around all the time. Okay. So yeah. So, okay. So then I'm sorry. So yeah. So Specialists are now DMMs, which is designated yeah, market makers. Exactly. So, like, yeah, but market makers they open and close the stock like that. Yep. It's like it's a heavy feat to do, and they're not just opening and closing one stock. So exactly. I feel like their job is way more stressful. Um, and then, of course, you know, as a trader on the floor, we were running to the DMMs um, for the morning and the close yeah. uh, to get looks and insight to how the stock was going to open and close and and so on and so forth. So their jobs, I feel like that is a little bit more complicated, but I think as far as trading goes, whether it's doing institutional trading or per personal trading, I, I think people over it more than it needs to be. I always say that it's a market, you know, we're either we're selling, you know, rugs or donuts or, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the only thing we get to do here is, you know, short the donut to retail, right? Right. You know, if we don't have inventory, but you know, yeah. 
All right. All right. I got, all right. I know we got to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. I got a couple more questions for you, Lauren. I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm, I'm into crypto decentralized finance. Um, and I, I think, you know, I wanted to ask you, I always ask every guest about it, what they think about it, but like, you know, especially like, you know, uh, what you're standing for, like empowering the retail investor underrepresented communities. And I think crypto and DeFi actually help promote that. Do you have any general overarching thoughts on cryptocurrency? Uh, well, I say educate yourself and do your due diligence. That is my response to everything. Me personally, <laughs> no, I don't um, mm. invest in crypto. Um, but I think because of the environment that I came from, you know, it, sure. it's more traditional. I do have a high risk tolerance, but for me, the data doesn't support me buying into crypto. But I do what I do believe is good about crypto. Um, is that a digital currency will make headway and that is going to be the new future. Now, whether that is Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies, only time will tell. Um, but I do think we are seeing in real time that um, digital currency is going to be the next big wave and the first country that can solidify their, their, their place in doing that um, is obviously gold. Um, and, and we'll see what the future looks like. So, you know, there, there are definitely pros and cons to it. And, but I say, you know, invest wisely, educate and do your due diligence. Absolutely. All right. So Lauren, tell us, tell us about the, the show going public air in October 19th. Of course, why I'm here. I'm so excited about going public again. All the things that I do today is an extension of making sure that we create a seat at the table and going public does just that. It democratizes the IPO space. It allows everyday retail investors, you, me, anyone over the age of 18 globally to invest in pre-IPO, typically to oh. For people that are listening to be able to invest in pre-IPO, you have to have a net worth over a million dollars. And so having this accessibility uh, for anyone to be able to invest is really cool. And all this is done through Reg A, which was signed into law during the Obama administration. And it allows um, companies in the early stages to be able to crowdfund and be able to get people that love their products, love their company to support them from the ground floor, and hopefully to be able to invest in the next Tesla and Amazon of our generation. Yeah, absolutely. That's how really was, cool. on, on a personal note, how was it for you? Was, what was the schedule like? Was it hectic? Very hectic, um, but just so empowering, again, to, to see these entrepreneurs go on roadshow, to see the diversity and inclusion that going public has sought out and made that a priority, seeing women find founders, seeing minority founders, um, seeing products that I think they definitely have found a problem and they found the solution to a problem. Um, the filming schedule, I think, in the unscripted space is always a lot, a bit more challenging than in the scripted space because these stories are happening in real time and so with that <clears throat> you can't schedule certain things and then you know at a moment's notice you're you end up flying to Miami or end up flying to Montauk or end up flying to Arizona so it, it's been a whirlwind um, this is something that I joined uh, going public back of August of last year and it is premiering October 19th and it is so exciting to see again another vision um, Darren and Todd, the creators of the show, I've been working on this, uh, I want to say for four years. So um, to see their vision actually materialize and to see it on screen in real time is so exciting. And I forgot to, to mention, yes, everyone can, can invest in real time, but you can click to invest. All the information of all the companies are on goingpublic.com. And to do your due diligence, I say read the SEC circulars. Um, and determine, you know, if these companies are a good fit to invest in. All right. Absolutely. And I wish you all the best of luck. I'm sure it's going to be a smash. And one last thing, Lauren, I want to ask you to end the note on, you know, I'm sure there, there's a bunch of different things that have made you successful, but, you know, how, how do you dealt with the adversity of not only being a minority, uh, but, you know, also a woman as well? What, what, you know, if you could maybe put it on like one, one thing, what kept you going through? Um, I think grit and perseverance, but I don't, I, I don't want to just reduce that to grit and perseverance. And like, I'm a woman and I'm African-American. I am all those things. I'm the South. I'm, I'm from the South. I'm short. Like, you know, I'm, I'm all these <laughs> things, but I think grit and perseverance for anyone, like, you know, yourself better than anyone, which means if you 
feel like you can do something, you can achieve something, then do it. Also understand that life will give you detours. And I always believe that those detours are pushing you into the right direction. So if you are doing something, you're getting no, 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 no. Don't necessarily take that as a, as a, as a sign to give up, but maybe just pivot maybe pivot a little bit and always be adaptable and flexible. And I think that goes to anyone trying to create whatever life they're trying to create. I don't, I don't think it, it solely is like, yeah, obviously it comes with challenges being a woman in this space. And, but I don't really let that noise get in my head. It's more of like, what do I believe? Can I do this? Do I want to do this? And I'm a type of person, once I put my, my mind to something, I will make it happen. And and we're, you guys are on this journey with me and you guys get to see it happening in real time with going public and all my other incredible projects. Awesome. I love That's it. Great. And that will conclude today's episode of Confessions of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed the episode, please rate and review it for us. If you'd like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, you can join JJ and myself at microefutures.com. Lauren, uh, tell the listeners where they can find you and anything else you want them to know. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys can find me on Instagram at LA Simmons. I know I'm so young. And then you can also find me <laughs> on LinkedIn um, for any updates on what's going on. And I'm excited for you guys to be on this journey. Please check out Going Public. Launch is October 19th. And please, 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 you know, come listen to the podcast. Um, only on Spotify, only on Spotify. So I will talk <laughs> to you guys soon. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you, Lauren. And so for Lauren Simmons, I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's a gorilla of House Street. You stop, though. So.